Brothers and sisters, this is the fourth session on a land flowing with milk and honey. Amidst God's power, the Israelites left Egypt, went through the life in the wilderness, and finally arrived at the threshold of Canaan. Through the shortcut, the distance from Egypt to Canaan is only a 10-day walk. Of course, those numerous people joined by cattle, ship, wagons, and the elderly and the young must have moved very slow. Even if we take this into account, they could have arrived in in one month or two. But God didn't lead them through the shortcut, but through the wilderness, which was a way longer path. Along the way, He sometimes had them stay in one place for a few days or months. As the Bible says, whether it was two days or a month or a year, that the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, staying above it. The sons of Israel remained camped, uh, which means they stayed, and did not set out. But when it was lifted, they did set out. When the pillar of cloud didn't move, they didn't move as well. That's why it took more than a year God had a cloud over their tabernacle. When the cloud didn't move, they didn't move as well. That's why it took more than a year for them to travel a distance which is actually not that long. You know, the blue line was the shortcut and the red line was the path the Israelites were taken They went through the Red Sea and went around the land to reach Canaan. Then, why did God lead them down a longer path? The answer is found in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. Now when the Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by a way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was nearer. For God said, the people might change their minds when they see war, and return to Egypt. If the Israelites were to take the shortcut, they would, have, they would have to pass through the land of the Philistines, which means they had to have a war with them. So God prevented them from having a battle. Of course, if only they had marched in with faith, they must have been more than able to defeat even an army of 10 million. But the Israelites were lacking so much in faith. Only if there was no food, they made a fuss, saying that they were happier as slaves. If these people had been told to fight, not only would they have disobeyed, but tried to return to Egypt. For this reason, God led them through the wilderness, which was relatively safe. Whenever they faced a trouble, God let them witness His power through Moses' faith, thereby offering them opportunities to grow their faith. Even though they were taking that path, God was giving them opportunities. God continually showed them power, His power. And why did the power... Why was the power shown? It happened by Moses, who pleased God. Through Him, His amazing power was shown. And God also desired them to grow their faith by seeing that power. It was by God's love. But the entry into the promised land required the faith of the whole congregation because they had to march forth with faith, defeat the Canaanites, and take their land. Suppose you were there with Moses. Would you be able to win the battles and conquer the land flowing with milk and honey? You. Suppose you were in that situation. Would you be able to do so? Asking these questions to you, please pay attention. Because you've witnessed numerous works of power, it's only natural that you should be able to take the land of Canaan through perfect deeds of faith. If you find yourself falling short of this, I hope that this message will inspire you to set your foot on the promised land indeed with faith. By doing so, I pray in our Lord's name that you will take possession of the blessings from the promised land. So far, as you listen to this message, you know, the Israelites, they they left Egypt safely, 
by Moses' guidance, but they forgot that power. Whenever they faced trouble, they still grumbled and complained. With such little faith, they were not able to conquer Canaan. That's why God allowed them to take a different path, giving them opportunities to grow their faith and over a and it was time for them to demonstrate the faith of the whole congregation and you what about how have you demonstrated your faith how have you pleased God and how have you resolved troubles and received the resolution of your problems as you look back on the history of Mount Min actually it, we cannot say that we received answers and blessings by our own faith just as Father God bless and answer them through Moses' faith. Likewise, we, by the shepherd's power and his intercessory prayer, problems have been resolved many times. Everyone, indeed, we have to make this confession because our faith lacks. Because our faith lacks, we request a prayer to see a pastor. If your faith was enough, you could have received the answer and shared your testimony. But because you, your faith lacked, you line up to meet Sina pastor. You know, Sina pastor didn't tell us to line up for him. You know, he, he was very busy signing the documents. He's, it was such a tight schedule, even that Even a young man couldn't handle, but people requested his prayer from early in the morning because you had problems that cannot be resolved by your, on your own. But you received the resolution of your problems. That's why you continue to come to receive his prayer. And whenever you receive prayer, you have your problems resolved. But the problem is, while senior pastor is not with us, how Have you been acting? The Israelites complained and grumbled even even when there was Moses. I mean, we shouldn't say we are better than the Israelites. The shepherd's power is being manifested again and again, continually. And you... while senior pastor is not here with us, what kind of confession did you make? And what kind of heart, what kind of mindset did you have? You have to examine your faith, comparing yourself to the faith of the Israelites during the Exodus, and then you can find the answer. As you realize about yourself and try to repent from your heart and turn from your ways, and as you acknowledge your lack of faith, as you repent and fix yourself, Father God will give you answers and blessings. But if you say like, I'm doing well, I'm doing good spiritually, if you are misconceived like this, you have to know that you cannot enter a better dwelling place in heaven. In addition, you you cannot receive answers and blessings in your situation. While seeing a pastor is not Here with us, you have to examine your life of faith, your thoughts, your mindset, your eyes, your faithfulness. You have to examine how they have been. You have to exactly analyze yourself. Brothers and sisters, now the Israelites have arrived in Kadesh, Padina, located right below Canaan. Kadesh Pernia is right there. It's just next to Canaan. And God instructed Moses to dispatch their chiefs, one from each of the twelve tribes, and spy out the land of Canaan. This was the beginning of the test. One, not just anyone from each tribe. God had him choose a chief. from each tribe. So overall, 12 people were sent to the land. That was the beginning of of the test required for them to enter the blessed land. For us to receive blessings, we should definitely prepare, 
We should definitely prepare a vessel and make ourselves qualified. By passing a test, we have to prove ourselves worthy of blessings. As for Abraham, the father of faith, he had come forth as a person proper for God's will through trials. Even so, God didn't bless him without a reason. Only after he passed the test of offering his son Isaac and demonstrated what kind of faith he had, God blessed him to become the source of blessings. We learn the principles of the spiritual realm in detail, and as you apply them in your own situation, you won't get discouraged in your troubles or hardships. You may face such things by your own sins, or you may, that could be your test of faith. You have to make a clear, clear discernment and act. Even though God knows all things, He gives us a test and blesses us only after we pass it. Otherwise, Satan would bring an accusation and God Himself wouldn't be the God of justice. God exercise exact justice. There is a law, but if God changes the law, God cannot be the judge. Then the forces of darkness will rebel against them. That's why God exercises His judgment, exercises things according to the exact justice, knowing, understanding, and at a proper time, He allows us to test, and as we pass it, God can say, Look, He has passed the trial and gives glory to me. And then He blesses us and answers us. While you offer v o w prayer or fasting to receive blessings, you may encounter a trouble. As you look back on yourself and find nothing to repent of, you can just give thanks and rejoice and try to please God all the more. Of course, if you find anything to repent of, you have to repent without delay. Then, your prayers will be answered quite quickly. It is God's justice that people who've prepared the vessel receive the answer. Only when things are done according to the justice, there is no accusation from Satan. Representing the whole congregation, the twelve spies were in a position to demonstrate their faith after spying out the land. The twelve spies passed through the land for 40 days. As expected, the land was flowing with milk and honey, and its fruit was beautiful. But there was a problem. There was no way that such fertile and good land was empty without owners. The six Gentile tribes were living in the land of Canaan, and they looked so strong and robust. And their cities were fortified and large, and it seemed never easy to conquer them. Seeing this reality, the ten of the twelve spies got discouraged. Coming back, they gave the people a negative report. As the Bible says, Caleb quieted the, quieted the people before Moses and made a confession of faith. Before that, the ten spies made negative confessions before the people. Hearing this, Joshua and Caleb couldn't just stand still. That's why they tried to calm the people down and they said, We sh- they urged them to go up and take the land by faith. Not relented by this, the ten spies confused the people with more evil words and fleshly confessions that didn't... They said, uh, the Bible says, the man who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, as are part of the Nephilim, and we became the, like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Everyone, once we let in fleshly thoughts, they develop into more evil and negative words. When the ten spies made a report, 
they did say the land was flowing with milk and honey, but as they, their fear, their fleshly thoughts made them talk about their reality, and they said, It was hard, difficult for us to take the land. But Caleb said, no, we, we can go and take the land. And the ten spies said, we cannot enter the land. If we enter the land, we may die. We may face a tremendous trouble. That's what they said. Everyone, in your own life, as you... let in your fleshly thoughts as you hear words of untruth as you agree with those words it doesn't stop there Satan continuously gives you thoughts after thoughts it gives you fear it gives you more stronger fleshly thoughts that's why you have to be careful with what you hear and Once you accept the fleshly thoughts, when anyone advises you with the truth, you don't like it. When you hear something right, you do more evil. You have to examine yourself in this regard. To what kind of words do we pay attention? Do you rejoice and agree with confessions of faith, goodness, and truth? Or do you like to hear and agree with words coming from fleshly thoughts, judgment, and condemnation? The congregation listened to the confessions of the ten spies and agreed. So they they were ten. They had to... There were confessions of faith and there were negative confessions and they have to make a right discernment. But the people, because 10 spies, the, they were greater in number. They, why did they accept such words? The people were, also had that kind of faith and that kind of heart. They sh- shouldn't have put the blame on the spies. They should, the problem was their own heart. They were swayed by such words. You shouldn't put the blame on others who deliver such bad words. You have to check yourself why you accepted such words. If you discern something is not right, if you discern something is words of untruth, you have to stop listening and and you can drive this drive away Satan and make him stop talking. But the people accepted the words. As a result, they wept all night, representing Moses and Aaron. The Bible says, the whole congregation said to them, the whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we have died in the wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? What kind of land they were referring to? They said, our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? The Israelites complained, why is the Lord bringing us into this land? But actually, they themselves cried and asked God to save them from slavery. Answering their pleas, God sent Moses to bring them out. They also said they would fall by sword. I mean, they also said they would fall by the sword and their wives and little ones will become plunder. But such things never happened. But they assumed that they they were happening for real and they wanted to return to Egypt. How frightening flesh these thoughts are. One thought led to another. They complained about what hadn't happened as if it was their reality and outrageously said it was... it would have been better for, to die in Egypt or in the wilderness. According to their confession, God had them die in the wilderness. According to their confession, according to their words, they shouldn't, have, they shouldn't blame God for that. Here, we have to bear in mind how important the words of our lips are. The Bible says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. We should never utter words recklessly. Let's say your reality is difficult, but 
then you have to keep your mouth shut. If you find your situation troubling, you have to keep your mouth shut and just pray. You can pray to God and you can say things to God. Like, Father God, I'm in difficulty, but I believe that you can resolve my problem. Even though my situation is a difficult, but if you intervene, things will be resolved. But if you say those things with people, they, some, some people just say to themselves, complaining about the situation, they complain about their reality, and that traps, it, their words traps them into more trouble. We we should get into the habit of always speaking honestly and precisely. In doing so, honesty is planted deep in our heart. Then we wouldn't be trapped into tribulations by our own words. But even if we decide not to speak recklessly, while we have evil in our heart and we are full of fleshly thoughts, we fail to control our lips. We may... understand the importance of our words and try to control our lips, but as you find yourself in some kind of situation, you are quick to do evil and utter words of untruth. That's why we have to cast off evil from our heart. Only then can our words be clean as well. After we say things carelessly, we cannot even remember our words. Because we cannot repent and the wall of sins remains, tribulations continue. Still, we don't know why. In your difficulties, you have to find a reason and repent of it. Only only then your difficulties will go away. Let's say you get stricken with a disease and then you have to discover your wall of sin and break down the wall of sin. Only then the disease will go away. But as you, if you, let's say you say something, If you say something easily, you forget what you said. You you are like, when did I say that? That's why you cannot discover the reason why such a thing happened. That's because you cannot resolve your problems. So if you are wise, you have to be careful with your words and say only necessary things and only make positive confessions. I urge you to control your lips and say only words of truth, uh, words of faith, goodness, and truth. Please keep in mind that your words can take away the faith of your family members and fellow church members, just as the t e n s e f i e s confessions resulting from your fleshly thoughts and the lack of faith led the people to commit sins. That's why the church leaders, church workers, should check what kind of words they are saying. They have to be always careful. If you, even if they hear words lacking faith, they have to correct them. And they have to drive away Satan that instigating such people. Church workers should be like this, but they shouldn't be like those ten spies who take away faith from their fellow members. God is the one who delivered them out of Egypt through the ten plagues and split the Red Sea so they could cross it as if they walked through the dry land. In the wilderness, He fed them manna and quails, turned their bitter water into sweet wine, and made water spring from a rock. He guided them with the pillars of cloud and fire. Having been shown many signs, they were quick to resent God and Moses and even defied Him. whenever they found their situation going against their benefits. Their evil and their lack of faith was just the same as it was when they first got out of Egypt. They even talked about appointing a leader and turning back to Egypt. Among the 12 spies, only only Joshua and Caleb lamented for their deeds lacking faith toward their clothes and appealed to them. They said, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good and good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not fear the people of the land, or they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And they, they were saying, The ten spies describe themselves as grasshoppers, but 
Joshua and Caleb said that they are out there to pray. What a different confession. They said that God was with them, so they didn't have to fear. What a wonderful confession that is. But the people didn't listen to this faithful confession of faith. Rather, they tried to stone them. Brothers and sisters, earlier I mentioned that God told them to spy out the land and that this was a test of faith required to take the blessed land. The correct answer was the confession of faith offered by Joshua and Caleb. Men of faith don't look at the reality visible to their eyes. You have to bear this in mind. Make sure to do so. Men of faith don't live just looking at the reality. They only try to figure out what God's will is and they march forth with confessions and deeds of faith that if the Almighty God was with them, they are more than able to fulfill His will. The important thing is, we, the important thing is, we have to please God. It's not just, it's only, if only God is, only if God is with us, we can be victorious. So, if we are in a trouble, we have to find ways to please Him. But people who lack faith, they try to do things that doesn't, Please, God, they show irritation, they show anger, and and they only do things that doesn't please God because they are instigated by Satan. If we make such a confession, not just with words, we shouldn't just... Along with the confessions of faith, we have to demonstrate these. Then God will be glorified through us. The Bible says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Another verse tells us, And and without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. From Genesis to Revelation, we find numerous cases where impossible things were made possible only by God's power. Only by God's power. You know, the events in the Bible, if... But... But Father God is the one who makes impossible things possible. He is almighty. That's why He he is not a human being. That's why He is God. But human beings continue to look at the reality. They only... That's what human beings are. But God's way is different from their ways. We have to realize this. Along with our confessions of faith, we have to please Him. That's what all we have to do. Even though they had experienced God's works numerous times, except for Joshua and Caleb, all of them failed this test of faith. Enraged by this evil people without faith, God proclaimed that He would destroy them through pestilence. Thanks to Moses' earnest plea, they managed to save their lives, but their hope for Canaan was no longer there. As a result of failing the test of faith and as the retribution for opposing God with evil words and deeds, all the people of the first generation, except for Joshua and Caleb, couldn't make it to Canaan. God's promise of Canaan was handed over to their offspring who are younger than 20. God said that even they would spend 40 years in the wilderness for their parents' sins and then enter the land. Also, the 10 spies who negatively reported on the land after spying on it died of a plague before God. The Israelites who heard this message of God's wrath and saw the deaths of the ten spies grieved with regrets. And they talked to Moses as we find they heard God's 
words of wrath. And God proclaimed that just as you confessed, they would, they would spend 40 years in the wilderness. They, God said that they would suffer a trial for 40 years, and just as their confession, they would die in the wilderness, and their next generation would enter Canaan. As after they heard this prophecy, you know, the land of Canaan was right before their eyes. And when they were told that they couldn't make it to the land, they should have repented thoroughly and lowered themselves. But how did did they react? The Bible says, In the morning, however, they rose up early and ran up to the ridge of the hill country, saying, Here we are, we have indeed sinned, but we will go to the place which God the Lord had promised. What does that mean? They said they would attack the village where the Canaanites lived. I mean, they made a negative report. They they said... it would have been better for us to die in Egypt. And they lamented like that. But after they heard Father God's prophecy, after they were told that they wouldn't make it to the land of Canaan, and after the ten spies suffered death by a plague, and then they should have repented thoroughly. Instead, They disobeyed again, but it was already too late. At this point, they just wanted to attack the Canaanites, but God was not no longer with them. Because Moses knew this, Moses earnestly deterred them from going, saying that it wouldn't be successful. He said, do not go up. or you will be struck down before your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites will be there in front of you, and you will fall by the sword. Moses said that if you go up the hill, you will be destroyed because you have betrayed God. He said, Inasmuch as you have turned back from the following the Lord, the Lord will not be with you. Despite having heard this warning, they... went up the hill where the Canaanites lived to attack them. Before, they refused to go when they had to go. Here, they were told not to go, but they insisted on going. Regrettably, the outcome was a miserable defeat, just as Moses warned them. They continually, repeatedly disobeyed. We cannot say that their attack on Canaan was a deed of obedience or faith. Let's say a student failed the college entrance exam, but he's found out the answers to the exam questions. Does this mean he can now enter the college? No way. He has to study more, improve his scholastic abilities, and take the exam with different questions. Only after he gets those questions right can he prove qualified to enter the college. Likewise, just because they went up the hill where the Canaanites lived doesn't mean they they suddenly got faith which they didn't have previously. They just pretended like they had faith. To recklessly charge into Canaan was not what they had to do. They should have repented of their evil indeed had spiritual faith and resolved to obey unconditionally. Of course, if they had repented from their heart, at least at this point, the situation could have changed. If they had thoroughly repented, rending their hearts, then Father God would have relented and changed His mind. But what they did was they disobeyed again. They went up the hill. which means they didn't show obedience. And throughout their life in the wilderness, as we take a look at their life, we can realize why they went through all this. But Israel didn't charge into the land of Canaan with a truly penitent heart. They only added another deed of disobedience to get away with their faults and avoid God's retribution. 
As a result, Israel suffered a painful defeat and their hard 40-year life in the wilderness began. Even in our life of faith, when we pass a God-given test, we get blessed. But if we fail it, we can suffer a trial for a certain amount of time. Just as a student who has failed a college entrance exam has to study one more year, the student s has to one more year. When they study an extra one more year, they feel nervous. They have to cut back on their sleep, sleeping hours and they have to study even harder. When God gives us a test, when we pass it joyfully, otherwise we, may, uh, we go through a trial. After, and then Father God tests again, We have to pass it, but if we fail it, then a trial follows again. That's why some believers continuously suffer trials. Some people, they receive advice, they get pointed out, then they should have, what what should they do? They have to rejoice for their advice that they received. They try to do things hard, but someone said they do did things hard out of their selfish motives and their own passion. They have to just say amen and accept that advice and rejoice and try to look at himself with the truth and ask Father God to realize about himself. He has to lower himself in prayer. Then the Spirit would remind him of his faults and the Spirit would help him uh, discover arrogance and they would... and he would repent of his arrogance and his selfish motives. And as he examines and checks himself in detail, and then they can receive blessing, and he can grow in faith. But other people feel disheartened, feel upset when they receive advice. They fall into temptation by that. And how they have no fullness of spirit. While, people, while other people are filled with the spirit, they have no full of spirit and they feel weary and worn out. As time goes by, they suffer a huge loss. But even at this point, they have to repent and turn from their ways and they have to figure out what problem they had. If they say, I'm doing good. They cannot repent. They have to lay down the thought that they were doing good. Then the Spirit reminds them of what kind of faults they did. But the Father of faith who entered the whole Spirit, they look back on themselves. That's what we learned. But if people, if you like, I've been doing good, I've been working faithfully, That itself is a fault. That itself is arrogance. That's why you have to lay down your arrogance, humble yourself, and ask the Holy Spirit to point out your... So if you cast that off, and then you can give the right answer, and as a result, you can receive answers and blessings and have your problems resolved. But some people repeatedly suffer trial. and fail. That's why, uh, that's because he has a change of heart. Once we believe in something, we ought to believe to the end without a change of heart and say amen. Then we can grow spiritually without a trial. If we face a trial, we can take this opportunity to grow our faith. You know, if you cannot pass a test, you can look back on yourself and change yourself, and then you can grow spiritually. Let's say you fail the first test, then you can pass the second test. You can develop yourself like this. If you discover your shortcomings through trials, repent and fix them, you are more than able to overcome the following test. Finally, you can confess that the trials have been a blessing. But if we complain amidst the trials and insist on ourselves, we may fall into temptation because of our evil. We shouldn't shouldn't be such foolish ones. Still, the first generation neither repented nor turned from their ways, even as they suffered the tribulation 
I mean, retribution of wandering in the wilderness. They didn't cast off evil, nor did they have faith. Due to their evil, the entire Israel once again suffered a disaster. This resulted from Korah and his followers' rebellion. According to God's word, the Israelites entered the wilderness and they became sick and tired of their life as they wandered for long. Meanwhile, Korah, one of the Levites, deceived people into opposing Moses. Biologically, Korah was Moses' cousin. As Korah compared himself to Moses, he considered himself not falling short in any ways. So he was upset about only Moses and Aaron having the authority of priests as men of God. He deceived 250 leaders who were famous in the congregation into opposing Moses along with him. Korah and his followers said to Moses, You have gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? But this is not true. When did Moses and Aaron go beyond the line and exalt themselves? It was God who exalted them and established them as leaders. When God first told Moses to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses reacted like, How could I bring them out of Egypt? He turned it down at first. For this reason, God demonstrated the evidence of him being with Moses and guaranteed him so that the people would follow him. They also mentioned that all the congregation were holy and the Lord was in their midst. If the congregation had really been holy, they wouldn't have sought their benefits in all circumstances. They they would have never complained or grumbled and opposed God. God, When God was in Sinai, what did the people say? God didn't come down quietly. There was... And while God came down, people were afraid. And people asked Moses, they didn't want to hear God directly. That demonstrated they were not holy. That's why Father God knew their heart, knew their... That's why Father God directly to Moses only, and He delivered His message through Moses. But what did Gora say? He said that the whole congregation was holy. And why do you... What they said was never truth. God was in their midst, not because they were good, but on account of Moses. God repeatedly told Moses that He would destroy them. He, He did repeatedly. But whenever that happened, Moses pleaded with God, saying, God, you shouldn't do so. Please give them forgiveness. Moses asked for their forgiveness, his forgiveness. But Korah said that the whole congregation was holy. Such evil words. God was in their midst because Moses, on account of Moses, not because the congregation was holy. But Korah opposed Moses and Aaron with false statements and lies. What they wanted to say was, What are you? How come you are our leaders? The words of Tathan and Abiram, who joined Korah in their rebellion, were even more outrageous. They said, It is not enough that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness. They were talking about when they said a land flowing with milk and honey was Egypt. They they were referring to Egypt like that. And they said, but you would also lord it over us. They claimed that they tried to become their king. If Egypt had really been a land flowing with milk and honey, why did they ask God to bring them out of there? Why did it cry out to Him for salvation? Obviously, Egypt was not a land flowing with milk and honey. They suffered there. 
But because they were filled with complaints, they began to like what they used to dislike. They changed their minds like this and that, like that. It could apply to us. We could, we began to like what we used to dislike. Through their confession, we have to examine ourselves. It could happen among our family members. When husband and wife argue, they talk about people have such a change of heart and such craftiness. They rebelled against Moses like that. Moses had notified them of God's will exactly and tried to lead them to Canaan safely. He never intended to kill them in the wilderness. Rather, whenever they were in the danger of being annihilated as a result of their disobedience and evil, Moses pleaded with God at the risk of his life and saved them. Even so, they attributed all their sins to Moses and blamed them for their failure to enter Canaan. Even though Moses never intended to make himself a king, they opposed him with such false statements and lies and deceived people. As Moses heard this and fell on his face, can you imagine how Moses felt? He must have lamented. So God directly resolved this issue. As Korah, Dathan, and Abiram stood in front of their tents along with their families, Moses prophesied their death. As soon as he finished speaking, the ground under them was split open and they all fell into Sheol alive. Also, the 250 leaders who joined Korah were burned to death at once by the fire of God coming from the incense they were offering. As I prepare this message, you know, you know, God judged them right away at, in, in this situation. But th- that doesn't mean that God always judges immediately in every situation. You know, God was, had been patient with them when Moses interceded for them. God repeatedly gave them opportunities. He also, he also gave them a disaster Through the, throughout the 40 years of their life in the wilderness, and their, God judged them immediately so that people could make a right discernment. Father God, when Father God punishes people right away, would it be good? Father God is patient when we pray for our answer when it feels like His answer is delayed through this time we can make our faith perfect as after one year, two years, three years If our heart changes, that demonstrates our faith was not true. So through this time, you have to figure out what Father God wants from you. Father God wants faithfulness and true faith from you. So you have to look back on yourself and become proper before Father God. No matter how foolish a person is, If he sees this happening, he should know where God's will lies. He can just see with whom God is. He can see whether God is with Moses or Korah. If the Almighty God is with someone, He would guarantee him with His power and manifest His works. God had always been with Moses, answered his requests, and worked through him. He'd never been with Korah. Then, no question, the Israelites should have been on Moses' side. But as Korah deceived them, 250 leaders, they were chiefs. They were leaders of the congregation. They joined him and sided with him opposing Moses. As their leaders were deceived, the people 
under their leadership naturally follow them. So even after Korah and his followers were destroyed, the Israelites came up to Moses and Aaron, saying, You are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. Korah rebelled against them. That's why God destroyed them. Seeing this, people should have discerned this situation. But they came up to Moses and said, You killed them. They were... How stupid they were. God Himself punished such rebellious people. It's God who did it. Seeing this, they resented Moses, claiming that He caused them harm. Moses never said to God, Please punish Korah and his followers. Suppose he he prayed that way? Even so, if that prayer wasn't proper, God wouldn't have answered it. If Korah and his followers had been good, indeed, they would have never suffered harm. Nevertheless, the Israelites resented Moses saying that he caused them harm. Just watching this scene, we find that it was only natural that they were defeated when they attacked the Canaanites. Earlier, we We know that it's only natural that they wandered in the wilderness for 40 day, uh, 40 years. Earlier, if they had sincerely repented, admitting that their agreement with the words of the ten spies, their complaining, their opposing Moses, and their evil resulted in their failure to enter Canaan, how would they have reacted to Korah? They wouldn't have joined him and his followers who made such false statements. Still, the Israelites hadn't cast off evil. They, with the land of Canaan right before their eyes, they couldn't enter Canaan, but they didn't admit that it was their fault. And they joined Korah in their rebellion. Still, the Israelites hadn't cast off evil in heart and stood against God to the end. To give awakening to such foolish people, God came up with this. God told Moses to take rods from Aaron and each leader of the tribes, one from each tribe. Have them write each of their names on the rods and put them in the tabernacle of God. He intended for the rod of God's chosen leader to sprout overnight so that it would serve as a sign. You know, A rod is carved out of a wood broken off a tree. How could it sprout ever? But it's possible with God. Only one of their rods sprouted. Moreover, it put forth buds and produced blossoms and it bore ripe almonds. No question that it no question that the rod belonged to Aaron, Moses' prophet. Namely, God demonstrated that he was with Aaron. Aaron. The Bible says, But the Lord said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put an end to their grumblings against me, so that they will not die. God told them if they grumble against him, they will die. You know, it's not that God punished or destroyed people whenever they complained, but God put this in the Bible as an example so that the Israelites could understand. And they, God was again and again patient and waited for them. God showed His sign in such a way to plant faith in the Israelites anyhow, but even that sign didn't work. Even thereafter, when the people went out of water, they complained like they did before. They got sick and tired of eating manna every day. They complained as they went around Adam. As a result, they were beaten by fiery serpents. They continued to grumble as they did previously. While with passing of time, the people of first generation died one by one as their life expired. Those who were little children as they left Egypt, 
grew up to become leaders. Finally, the period of 40 years set by God was almost over. It was time to finish their wandering in the wilderness and again advance to the land looking to God's promise. Let me talk about what happened later in the next session. All the people of the first generation died in the wilderness as the result of resenting God in Kadesh Barnea, bearing responsibility, bearing responsibility as their leaders. Moses and Aaron couldn't make it to the land as well, but only the two individuals, Joshua and Caleb. were promised that they would enter Canaan along with the next generation. Unlike the people who hardened their hearts despite witnessing numerous works of power and died in the wilderness, Joshua and Caleb changed their heart into truth and developed true faith. Thus, even as they saw those robust Canaanites and their fortified cities, they were not frightened. We have to realize this. They all saw the same thing. They made different kind of confessions and demonstrated different kind of deeds. The difference was their faith. And it was whether they had evil or not, whether they changed their heart or not. You know, when people live in peace, some people may think if you change your heart, I mean, Instead, they boldly confessed, if the Lord is pleased with us, then He will bring us into this land and give it to us. I hope that this confession will be your confession. Their confession is applied to us as well. If God is pleased with us, anything is possible. If you you find your situation impossible, if you please God as His son and daughter, everything can be resolved. Only if you please God, I mean, you can please God by spiritual faith, and by spiritual faith, Joshua and Caleb could please God. The Bible says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Another verse tells us, For we have become partakers of Christ, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. As said, we should hold fast to the end of what we believed in and hoped for when we first began. If you set a goal of entering New Jerusalem, even when you discover your shortcomings or face hardships along the way, your hope shouldn't change. Your deeds of faith, like your deeds of faith, like uh, praying without ceasing, working faithfully, and circumcising your heart, shouldn't change as well. Some people confess when the pastor comes back, I will work hard. This. This demonstrates that your heart has already changed. When God is not with us, you have to rely on your wisdom, but the world is not an easy place. You have to please God. And if He is pleased, but we shouldn't have changed our heart to please Him. Some people say, when the pastor comes back, I will do hard, but they are just like the ten spies. We have to do hard right now. We have You should have, shouldn't have changed your heart. I hope that you remain strong and bold like Joshua and Caleb in all circumstances and please God, thereby receiving all what you pray for, both in spirit and in flesh. In doing so, I pray in our Lord's name that you will only march forward without ceasing until we fulfill all our duties and partake in the glory of New Jerusalem promised to us. Hallelujah! Almighty Father God of love, please lay your hands on all brothers and sisters receiving this prayer here in attendance. Lay your hands on all the members of the brain churches and local centuries, and all the GCN TV viewers, and those who are watching via satellites, 
cables and internet all over the world, transcending space and time. Plant faith in their hearts and drive out their negative thoughts and doubts. Let all the trials and afflictions leave them. By the fire of the Holy Spirit, from head to toe, scorch their sick and affected parts, including all cells, tissues and nerves, all internal organs and intestines. Let the light of creation come upon them. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, germs and viruses, and infirmities, go away. Let the light shine on them. Scorch their incurable and long-term diseases by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Burn all kinds of endemic and contagious diseases like malaria. Be cleansed and made well. All epidemic diseases, such as colds and fever, go away from them. Protect them from any kinds of germs and viruses and bacteria. Heal them of all kinds of cancers like stomach cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, womb cancer, intestinal cancer, and all other diseases like AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, women's diseases, thyroid diseases, and all inflammations. Let them be made whole from polio, stroke, arthritis, herniated discs, and many others. Let all kinds of pains disappear from them, like back pain, headache, and neuralgia. Set them free from epilepsy, autism, depression, neurosis, and all other mental diseases. Loosen them from all kinds of paralysis, and let them get up, walk, and jump. Let them regain good eyesight and restore good hearing. Let the blind open their eyes and the deaf come to hear and mute begin to speak. Heal them of after effects of all kinds of accidents. Restore their ruptured and broken bones. Restore them from burns and let the heat and burning sensation go away from them. Father, let there be no scars left. Be cleansed from all kinds of drug addictions and poisoning. Father, regenerate dead nerves, tissues and cells and bring the dead back to life. Father, please bless them to conceive a baby. Bless them to conceive a baby. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command the enemy devil and Satan, the ruler of the air, the evil forces and their servants, go away from them. Go away, you evil spirits, unclean spirits, deceiving spirits, spirits of falsehood, separating spirits and all forces of darkness. Loosen all bones of wickedness and darkness and go away from them. Let the light shine on them. Father God, give them strength to cry out in their prayer and empower them with the power to cast off sins and become sanctified. Let them be in good health as their soul becomes prosperous and let their family be evangelized. Protect them from all kinds of accidents and disasters and bless them to lead a successful and prosperous life in everything. Please protect your children, their home, their business and their work by the fiery hedge of the Holy Spirit with the heavenly host and angels and with your blazing eyes. Give students wisdom and understanding and fill their hearts with more passion and desire for study. Keep their hearts and minds from worldly things and plant into their hearts more fervent love for God. Bless your children and let them give glory to you in everything they do, whether they eat or drink or whatever they do. Let them confess and testify to the living God, I've met God, I've experienced God, and received His answers and blessings. Father God, thank you. Let all glory be to you alone. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.